welcome to Alex and Annie, the real women of vacation rentals. I'm Alex. And I'm Annie. And we are joined today with Stuart Butler, who is the CMO for the Myrtle Beach Area Chamber of Commerce and CVB. Stuart, welcome to the show. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> This, this is a long time coming that, that for it's amazing to, to think that I have you on our podcast because I've been a massive fan of, of your podcasting days, which were there were many years there that looked forward every Wednesday or Tuesday, I think it was <laughs> for your release to come out. But uh, we're very excited to have you here. And you've got such a rich history within travel and hospitality and more recently on the on the chamber and CVB side. But uh, very excited to have you here today. I'm excited to be here. It's, I've missed podcasting, so I'm, I'm glad to brush off some dust and hopefully do you guys proud. And I've been yeah. listening to your show. You, it's excellent. You, you nailed it. The, the uh, camaraderie you have, just the rapport, it's, it's great. It's entertaining, right? Which is what it needs to be first and foremost, entertainment and then education. And you guys nailed both sides of that, but it's entertaining more than anything else. Oh, thank you. Thank we you. Appreciate that. You know, I remember um, I was a little bit nervous when I sent you the first episode because your feedback was important. <laughs> I know you're, you're so skilled in this. We've got a long ways to go to get to where where you were, but um, we're we're working towards it. But no, you're doing great. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're way ahead of where we were by this time. Like our first thirty episodes, you know, back in whenever that was, 2015, 16, oh. were, were pretty rough. And so you, you guys, it sound like professionals from day one. It's been oh, fun. Thank it's you. Fun. We, we appreciate that. We appreciate yeah. that. Um, Stuart, to get started, um, I know, you know, I, just to, for our audience, in case um, I'm sure most people don't know, but um, I'm the chair of the board of directors for the Myrtle Beach Chamber and CVB that Stuart works for. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of, I get questions on this quite a bit uh, on what our chamber is and what a, not what a chamber is, but what the CVB is versus what the DMO is. And I'm going to give my uh, explanation of that, and you can tell me yours if I miss anything. Here, okay. You actually, perfect. You work at the day to day. I I, I work uh, on the side of <laughs> support, but um, so Myrtle Beach is a unique entity in that we are a chamber and a CVB in one. And in most destinations, they are two separate organizations. But we've uh, combined forces here to be one group um, and CVB stands for uh, uh, Convention Visitors Bureau and the DMO stands for a Destination Marketing Organization. Um, so Stuart, why don't, can you tell a little bit about what that means in your world? Yeah, yeah. And so I, I think if you look back historically, a lot of destinations started out with the CVB slash DMO being a part of the chamber, but then over the years, they've, they've sort of separated because their agenda has, has kind of shifted. And so they're not necessarily aligned between behind their goals. What, what's been interesting here, and I think I think about 10% are still combined, but the vast majority, 90% plus are, are separate. But, you know, a chamber of commerce, I think most people know is, you know, they're, they're a representative organization made up of business members. So they represent the business community in a destination. And it just so happens in Myrtle Beach that, you know, 85, 90% of our businesses are either directly or indirectly tied to tourism. And so it makes sense for us in a lot of ways to, to keep that together with the CVB. Um, so the CVB, you know, for us and for me personally, what, how I look at it is our job is to promote the destination in a way that drives incremental business. You know, we want to certainly keep the people that are coming happy in, in, and we'll talk about this later on because it's, it's part of my secret source of marketing, but we want to turn those into our advocates, you know, by spreading positive word of mouth. So we're certainly focused on who's coming and why they're coming and making sure they're having a great time. But then, you know, really our job is to go find new, new people to come and the, why it's a CBB convention and visitors bureau it's, is the scope isn't just leisure travel. It also gets into group travel and, and things like that. So we have a sales team here that, that going out trying to find meetings and conferences. We, we've got folks looking at um, bus tours. We've got folks trying to bring in sports tournaments, you know, a lot of, a lot of youth sports in this area. So really we, we run the gamut in terms of uh, who we target, but that that's, you know, our job every day is how do we figure out how to drive value to our local stakeholders, our businesses, our residents by driving incre incremental tourism. And, and a DMO, Destination Marketing Organization, is really just the designated entity within a, a destination that is responsible for that. So in our case, we're the sole DMO 
for the Myrtle Beach area, but we also represent it with a DMO for the, the larger Grand Strand. So we represent 14 communities, including inland like Conway and Laris and Aner and Socasty, but, but also North Myrtle Beach and you know, all the way down to Pauly's Island. So it, it's a pretty far reaching DMO. One interesting thing that's happening now though, is a lot of DMOs are beginning to call themselves DMMOs. So it's a destination, um, marketing and management organization. So they're getting a lot more into the placemaking side as well as the, the promotion side as well. That's a really boring answer, but hopefully it <laughs> sets the table. No, DMNO, is that what you said? MM. So destination, oh, okay. marketing and management organization. Right. Yeah. So, okay. Which yeah, you're seeing I, us do a little bit. You know, we, we haven't switched that designation to add this second M, but we, we're certainly playing more in that role of. How do we make it a great place? We're working with our cities and towns and we're working with other organizations like economic development and such to, to bring, in, bring in new offerings within the area. So as it relates to um, kind of our listeners, our core listeners are vacation rentals. Um, I am in the Panama City Beach market, so very similar to Myrtle Beach. And we had gone through kind of a metamorphosis years ago where our Chamber of Commerce was actually doing a lot of the marketing and handling the advertising for the destination. And then we had a CVB that was kind of coexisting with them, I don't want to say peacefully, but they weren't really working well together. And now they, they do work well together. Um, but one of the things that was always glaring was that the vacation rentals were not kind of incorporated in the message of the market. It was very much controlled by the hotels. And so I think we're seeing that shift uh, as the focus on vacation rentals comes. And again, similar markets, Panama City Beach and Myrtle Beach ring very heavy in, in condominiums and, and vacation rentals. How are you seeing the ability to incorporate that type of accommodations or getting those people that have those accommodations within their portfolios as uh, it, you know, invested in uh, the marketing message and participating in the message? Yeah, and, and it, it, it's, I mean, it's really complex how DMOs function. And, and a lot of what you've seen from a behavioral standpoint is a direct result of how they're funded. So if you look historically, most DMOs are funded through an ATAX or some other tourism-based fee that primarily is driven by hotels, right? The, the, in most destinations, hotels are the largest driver of right. revenue for them. So, so that kind of gives them that, that power and leverage. In a lot of areas, and as included too, the, the weird thing is a lot of that money is restricted money. You can only use it for certain things, i.e. promotion and advertising. You can't use it for, say, salaries and, and operations. So a lot of um, DMOs end up creating a, a, a mechanism to generate un, what we call unrestricted money, so money we can spend on salaries and whatnot. So a lot of times the people that are driving that train end up again being the hotels because they're making a large chunk of the, the revenue in the market. So again, it's, it's like hotels get the power because that's where the money's coming from. What, what we've done, and I've only been here in, in the Model Beach DMO for, for eight months, but we recognize that's a challenge because if you look at most destination marketing organizations' websites, they're very, very hotel centric. They're not really selling the destination as well as they could. They're not selling the reason why people travel. In, in Most people don't travel because of the accommodations, right? They have to stay in accommodations and they want choice, but they're staying because of the events or, or the, you know, the amenities. Wait, they're not coming for the hotel room? Are you, are you serious? Isn't that amazing? Right? <laughs> yeah. For the King's, King's Suite King's with an oceanfront balcony? Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Like people forget. That like in, our, in both of our cases, Model Beach and Panama City Beach, they're coming for the beach primarily. That's yeah, number yeah. one. Number two might be dining, might be golf, might be rest, um, might be shopping, you know, might be the, the attractions, it might be a festival. But way down is the accommodation. So one of the things that we, we've tried to deconstruct is, well, how, how do we tell a better story of what Model Beach is and what it has to offer? In, in order to do that, we need to focus a little less on the hotels. And it was really weird me coming in because I had 20 years of history working with hotels. Everyone thought I was the hotel guy coming in and it would just be yeah. a <laughs> right. hotel, right? But, but I've done the, the opposite. I like to create what I call gravity in a destination, like something that attracts people. And so how, how do we talk about what the gravity is to attract people? And it, and it certainly isn't hotels, but it is 
once people have been sold on the destination, it is the DMO's job to tell people that there's a variety of options. And I think one of the reasons Mono Beach was so successful last year, one of the reasons Panama City has been pretty successful over the years is the diversity of accommodations. It gives people choice. You know, both of these destinations have a lot of hotel, traditional hotel product, but both flagged and independent. They have a lot of condo hotel product, which which means that that you know the hotel rooms have full kitchens or kitchenettes, and then they also have vacation rentals and beach homes, which offers a little more privacy or a little larger scale, so you can meet as a group. And and who doesn't love traveling with their friends or family, you know? So, I think this this era where hotels have driven the train is is, is past, and I think we're now moving into an era where we as DMOs are, are recognizing why people travel. And then we're really trying to tell the story of the diversification of offering. Because when I travel, depending on why I'm traveling, I may want a different experience. So I'm traveling with my family. I may want a vacation rental beach home, you know, where I've got more space and, and privacy. If I'm traveling on business, I probably just want a hotel room, you know. So being able to understand who that consumer is, why they're traveling, and tell them that whatever it is they're doing and whatever they want, you, they have choice. So it all comes down to choice. Yeah, and I think you know you coming into this role. That's why it was such a powerful hire for us because in your experience, you were COO of Fuel Travel, which that was a hotel specific hotel marketing organization. Correct? Yeah, correct. We were a software company and a full service agency. So we, we built that up really over twenty years, um, starting out as just a simple web development shop. In um, we we figured out pretty quickly that people. And this is this was kind of sort of the early 2000s um, when when it was when it was actually created in the late late 90s. I started in the early 2000s, and we were trying to figure out what we wanted to do. But it wasn't until 2015 we became fully focused on the hotel space. And by that time, we had booking engine software, CRM software, we we had a mobile app, we had all these tools to help independent hotels compete with the with the flags. And um, it was pretty it was pretty interesting. But but uh, you know we we ended up selling the software off. At the end of last year, which is what kind of prompted me to say, well, maybe it's it's time for a, a new chapter. I, I felt like I'd had a good run there for 20 years and and this job just happened to open up. I, I wasn't ever planning on, on becoming a destination marketer, but it, it sort of fell in, in my lap and glad it did because now we're, we're the relationship that I've built over 20 years are really paying dividends as I helped this market grow. Yeah. And I think you know, your experience with fuel, it doesn't matter that you were specifically focused on hotels. I mean, your, your breadth of experience within hospitality marketing could go on any vertical. I mean, there's so much that we do on the DMO side that we're promoting everything about the destination. And I think you've brought a great perspective to that. But um, you know, our market is different too. You, know, you kind of touched on this, but vacation rentals are within our properties that really operate as essentially hotels when they have a front desk, they do the F and B and they check the guests in there, but they are individually owned units. So, I mean, we've always, you know, our hometown has had that mix of inventory there. um, And you've gotten to see, I've gotten to see the the challenges that presents in terms of how, you know, you can market between being a hotel and being a vacation rental. You're kind of both at the same time. And that's how our market really has, has grown, but um, has been able to offer so much value to our visitors too. But I mean, as, as far as, you know, when we're looking at competition, uh, both as a destination and individual businesses, you know, I think our destination is very good on the collaboration side, but how do you, how do you view that now? I mean, is it, what yeah. are you seeing for, from the competition in other destinations and, and how should we be looking at that? Well, the good, the good news for Mono Beach, but the bad news for travel is that most, most DMOs are so fixated on their internal stakeholders that they're fixated on their their government organizations that fund them. They're fixated on their their members if they're a member driven organization, and 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 I, I would say we've been guilty of that in the past. But it, but the, I think it's a mistake, and and here's why. I think at the end of the day, marketing is always about the consumer, right? It's always about who's consuming the product or service that you're you're trying to promote, and. You know, before I got all into hotels in 2015, I, I spent a lot of time in the e-commerce space. We worked with big consumer brands like Southern Tide and Yeti Coolers and really under, learned to understand how people behaved online and what drove con- consumption and interest and in all that stuff. And so the big pivot we made eight months ago when I joined here was instead of us, no offense, Alex, because you're, you're, you're a 
both a board member and, and, <laughs> and our chair, but it's less about us driving um, direct value to the accommodations by focusing on the accommodations. It's right. more about driving value to the destination, which results in value to the to the absolutely yeah. here, right. So we we we're in the process right now of fundamentally um, rethinking our infrastructure. We're, we're, I'm a big believer that paid advertising in its traditional form is is diminishing in value. Like we spend most of our budgets as marketers leasing space on someone else's audience, right? So we pay right. a lot of money to Facebook, to Google, to people like that. And, and it's gone, it's fleeting, right? It's, it's once we've spent that money, we have to continue to feed the beast if we want to continue to compete. And so how, how do we take that money and invest in, in annuities? And, and I think there's, there's two primary areas you should be in, everyone, every marketer should be investing in. One is data and infrastructure around data. And then the other is content. And the reason is that they will continue to pay dividends year after year after year. So we've got two big initiatives, well, three big initiatives right now. One is we're investing heavily in a, in a CDP, a, a customer data platform. And we're on a mission to really understand every touch point of the consumer's journey from, from you know, initial inspiration, consideration, booking, enjoy, anticipation, the actual stay, post stay, remembering, sharing, and all that. So we, we're really mapping out every touch point we have and how do we collect data in a way that's not self-serving, but actually improves the guest's experience. That's the key. You gotta keep your, your focus on the, the guest. So we're doing that. We're also overhauling our website. You're, you're gonna sit on that task force. We just oh. got RFPs <laughs> in, yeah, 12 to look. And like two time. weeks of time blocked off um, for this massive Yeah, it, it's a beast. <laughs> but that's a big project because at DMO websites, yeah flawed in that people don't use them to choose where they're going to stay like there was someone at a conference a couple of years ago that stood up in in front of and i won't say the destination but they asked everyone in the audience all dmos they said how many of you used the this destination's dmo website to research before you came to this destination and not one hand was raised right yeah so there's a fundamental problem in that it's not serving the needs of the consumer so so we're doing that and i think it's more of a media and entertainment site than it is a a traditional travel site and then third is we are building a massive army and this is where the collaboration comes in you have so many content creators in and around your market right so the dmos that are being successful right now are the ones that are going in weaponizing those. So rather than the DMO controlling all the content and pushing it out in like this vanilla, generic, nonsensical, non-useful way, let's go create value by creating interesting, diverse content from multiple voices that becomes a utility so people can actually make decisions about where they're going to stay and what they're going to do and all, all that stuff. So every everyone should be doing that. And, and we, we're really on this bandwagon that I, I didn't coin this phrase. I don't know where it came from, but I, I was trying to come up with a term for it. And I stumbled upon this term, but branded media or branded entertainment. So, so we, we believe that just like this podcast, you have to create entertainment first. You have to give a reason that people are going to tune in every week, because if they don't, they're not going to hear the message. Right. So it has to start with entertainment. And then the message is embedded. It's a Trojan horse, right? So you're educating people on vacation rentals, but they can get vacation rental education anywhere, right? It's everywhere on the internet. They choose to listen to, to you guys because it's entertaining. They enjoy it. They look forward to it. So this is, you're already on this path of branded entertainment. And that's what every, every marketer should be doing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we're on that path of turning Myrtle Beach into, I think you've, you've said this into a lifestyle brand, which mm -hmm. really plays into what we've been working towards for several years, but now it's, it's really come to, coming to fruition with the right tools to make it possible. But, um, you know, internally with our own companies that are part of the CVB, we've been learning from this concept for the last several years and you know how you turn your guests into true brand evangelists for your company. Mm -hmm. um, and we've, we've done certain things. Um, Flip2 is one of those tools that um, the Chamber and CVB brought to us probably about four years ago, I'd say. And it's you know one of the best tools that we use as marketers in our company and for the destination as well. Um, do you want to speak to a little bit about what that tool does uh, yeah. for us as a destination? Yeah, I'm, I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I, we've been using it for four or five years now. And um, 
you know, it really is a way to system systematically approach what you're talking about. So you're hundred percent right. Your, your consumer, your happy guest is always your best advocate, right? Mm -hmm. And, and they're, they're what we call your secret sales force. If you turn every guest into an advocate, your job is a whole lot easier as a marketer. So, so first part of that is you've got to make sure they have a great experience, which means at the very beginning, you've got to set expectations the right way. So they don't come and get shocked in a negative way. You want to surprise and delight them and just make them giddy about the experience. Then you have to find a way to unlock that potential. What Flip2 does, and, and it, it has a couple of components, but I'll talk about their advocacy component because it's really, it's, it's great. Is it, it engages the consumer at an appropriate point. It engages them after the stay in a, in a way that's really a soft initial touch. And it asks them a couple of questions and it's, you know, what could we have done better? What could we, have, you know, what, what would you have liked to see us do? You know, what would, what did you really like about us? Um, so it's those three kind of common questions you've heard throughout history in, in sales and marketing. And then depending on the responses, if someone's favorable, they, they're likely to want to go on and um, comment positively, they'll ask them to share a story. And the, sh the story is usually in the form of a photo in, in a memory or, or some comment on their stay. And, and it's really interesting because you see a diverse range of why people enjoyed their trip. It, it, it's a lot. But where the real power of Flip2 is, is it then it gamifies that and turns that into a contest and encourages that person to go share it on, um, on social media so that they can win something. And then the people that will vote on that person get caught into the trap too. It asks for their email addresses and gives them a chance to win something as well or an incentive. And a lot of times with accommodations, that incentive can be something that leads towards a booking. So this is what they call a warm introduction or a warm lead. So by voting on your friend's story to win, you may unlock a 10% discount at that same property. And we know as marketers that the, you know, the consumer we have today, a next best target consumer is, is them, right? Because repeat business is the easiest to get. The next best consumer to get after that is the friends and family of your current consumer. Absolutely. Because people yeah. tend to look alike in terms of what they like in what they choose and things like that, right? So if you can now say everyone that stays at my property, not only is going to choo choose to tell everyone, is not only going to choose to cons to submit a photo and a story about it, which I now have content, which I can tell to everyone, right? I can use that in, in my marketing, which is powerful, but they're also going to tell every one of their friends and family on social media that they had a great time at your property as well. So it just, it blows up exponentially in terms of your reach, but yeah, it, it I mean, starts with having a great experience. We've, we've, we've seen it just completely blow up literally over the last few years that it, it started you know, kind of modestly. And then, oh my gosh, over the last few years, we've grown our email list. We've grown our online exposure, our yeah. social following just exponentially. And it's, you know, it's not rocket science. I know, Stuart, I know you have a degree in, in rocket science, but this <laughs> actually know. is, it's not rocket science. It's actually, it's very um, ground, you know, it's very grounded and sound and it's in yeah. the conceptual way that it works, but the way that they've put it together is the secret sauce there that it's, I've never seen anything else out there that's quite like it, but yeah. Yeah, um, yeah really I was just powerful, right? Because they, they, it, Ed St. Ange is, is one of the owners of that company. And he, he made his name in the hotel space, creating Easy Heal, the, the first channel management. So he's a guy that sees a problem and, and develops a solution for it. And he's never really just developed software. He, he develops point to point solutions, including strategy. And that's the difference with Flip2. There are other things, tools out there that do similar stuff, but none of them quite package it in the way where it's, it's foolproof. They have the full strategy. And so I, I would encourage every, every accommodation, really any business that's dealing with a consumer to consider Flip2. It's F-L-I-P.T-O. Yeah, and we're, we're going to have Ed on the show. Um, I think we record with him in the next couple of weeks. So that'll be coming up. Yeah, we'll, he's great. We'll go in more detail on it. Yeah. He's, he's one of the smartest people I know and very, uh, very opinionated. Which, <laughs> yeah. Which is good. <laughs> yeah. It's good to spar with if you disagree. But um, but that product is, is lights out. It's just, it's a no brainer. When I was on the marketing side for hotels, it was the first thing on my budget every year for every one of my clients. It, yeah. it was a, it was just so powerful. And they've got other tools that are coming now, like their discovery tool is, I think is going to revolutionize the, the booking process. And, and yeah. we're going to integrate that heavily in our new DMO site. 
Well, it's interesting. I just I just got back from Vegas last week and was walking around uh, the Bellagio and the I forget what they call it. It's like the sanctuary, the section in the middle with all the 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 plants and the fish and it's just the beautiful lights and everything. And literally, all people are doing is they have their phone out and they're just staring at their phone taking pictures. They're not looking at anything that's there. I mean, everybody wants. They're more concerned about taking. I mean, myself included. They're not taking a picture so I can send it back home to everybody. Right. I tried to walk around a little bit so I didn't completely bump into people. But um, you know, trying to be in the moment is a challenge for everybody these days. But that's just the nature of our consumers now that they are they are so cognizant of making sure they're taking pictures to show where they were and that totally leads into not only flip to but just our whole marketing approach as a destination and individual companies that you know you've got to give them those instagrammable moments and right. when you when yeah. they have them you now want them to be able to share those out to their friends and family because they are your best recommendations yeah and and i think too it, it you know whenever there's a shift in behavior you've got to look at what it was the opportunity there's always opportunity and shift right and, and so I think, especially with COVID, it, it, it's changed how we interact with our devices. It's changed how we interact with each other. And you're right. A lot of people are so, you know, head down. We're going to have a lot of neck issues in the next generation. For sure. yeah. People's yeah. heads are always looking down. But um, what, how we've leveraged that, you know, with, with people's adoption at, a, at an exponential rate of QR codes, I think it's a really neat and simple and elegant solution to a problem we had before, which is how do how do we how do we understand people's behavior when they're in market and on property? And, and so what we've started doing just as a test, and this will be a part of our CDP is how do we create a T QR code ecosystem throughout the destination that is frictionless, but is a utility it offers value to people. So how, how do we create, you know, something, and, and it could be as simple as like restaurants do it with the menus or whatever, but it could be, um, at check with the check-in packets in instead of having a physical guide in the room or something it could just be scan here for the events that are going on right now and you could have signage throughout the the properties um, you can have them at local area attractions and events you can unlock discounts so we're really saying okay how do we bridge this offline world to the online world how do we get people from their their real world walking around looking at their phones to to join in on a in a community online and how do we capture data about that consumer not just who they are but what they're doing while they're in, in town and and if you extract excuse me if you extrapolate that out you can really get a three-dimensional view of what makes people's decisions you know in terms of why they're coming to the market and what they're doing you know you you talked about um kind of the going back to the engagement and getting people when they come to the market to share their experiences and the Panama City Beach um, CVB started a program and I don't it's been around for as long as I can remember currently but I don't know how many years but real fun beach that was kind of what they kind of dubbed our destination what used to be known as the world's most beautiful beaches and it was real fun beach but in that there was the real fun beach hashtag and then they created the hashtag my my pcb and had people mm -hmm. send in their photos and then they just populate them on the website and it is really interesting to see the difference in what people are experiencing why they're here like some people are you know it's it's about the view from their balcony or it's something on the beach and, and it can be something eating at a restaurant but it's just everybody's experiences are different and they are again they just become the brand ambassadors for the destination and it's just it's non-paid content that just builds up you know their their audience and and i think it just drives engagement from people who maybe sure. never would have come to the beach before but they see like oh there's things to do besides the beach and we talked about um both of both the destinations panama city beach and, and myrtle beach very heavy in sports and i know for our destination here the sports just like the week of christmas we were almost sold out just because we had baseball tournaments at Yep. the second new uh, sports complex that we have and they're building more facilities that go around it and i wanted you to talk about something that you had brought up um in what you guys are doing in myrtle beach was um the e-sport so it's like again going you know people are on their phones people are very electronically engaged and maybe not so much um, going to the beaches you know they were 10 years ago that was all they were doing but now they're coming to the beach to play games on their computer. And I, th I find that so interesting, <laughs> but it's, but again, it, it speaks to, you know, where, where generations are going. It's a, it's a business that can be year round. It doesn't matter if it's raining, you know, it's, right. it's things that people can do. So I think you guys have a really good program to kind of dip into that, um, that, uh, you know, 
I guess, segment of business, if it is one. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about yeah, that? Yeah, we, we think it's a big opportunity for a lot of destinations. And the great thing is most destinations are resistant to it because there's a stigma around it. And, and so we've really done a lot of groundwork to, to prepare our market for this new trend. And, and it, and it I say new trend, it's really not, it's been around for a while, but yeah. we commissioned a, a, a study over a year ago, which which basically was a feasibility study to look at what facilities we had, what are the needs of folks that put on esports. And so let's step back a little bit and define what esports is. So esports is essentially gaming versions of, of what we now know as sports, right? So, but it doesn't have to, have to necessarily be, you know, someone playing NASCAR or someone playing football, or whatever. It could be any video game, but the behavior of these these groups is very similar to sport. You see, most high schools now are developing sanctioned groups for esports, and they're competing against other high schools. We see most colleges now are now participating in national competitions. We also see there's a professional circuit where people are filling out Madison Square Garden with professional gamers and and hundreds of thousands of people coming to watch them. So there's it's just like with sports, right? You you have a spectrum of, of events. So if, if the analogy I kind of make is you, you have like pro level football, you have college level football, and then you have like kids playing football tournaments, right? Or you could do the same with baseball, right? You have right. the MLB, and then you have the minor leagues, you have collegiate baseball, um, go Shana Clears. Um, and then you also have kids coming to your destination to play in these tournaments, right? So it's similar in esports. You have the pros, you have the colleges, you have the high school kids and, and younger. So how do we tap into that? And, and for destinations like Panama City and Myrtle Beach, it's really important because we don't get a lot of business travel, right? right? Like a like a New York does. So we have to find ways to to build a base of demand, and then we can kind of yield our rates up for leisure transient consumers. So with us, it's traditionally been sports, a little bit of meetings, but primarily sports has been how we drive at base. But now with esports, we think there's an opportunity to bring college tournaments and other stuff here. And the facilities don't need to be that that robust in terms of you don't need big arenas. It, it, you need, you know, because you, you can have scaled events in multiple hotels at a time. You can repurpose your convention center. You just need good bandwidth and some of the other equipment. And, and so you can have events that are like 20, 30 teams. You can have hundreds of teams, just like with baseball and, and, and football and cheerleading and all the other sporting events. The great thing is, because a lot of the people making decisions at the DMO level tend to be older generations, they're not getting it. They're not, they don't understand right. the potential that's coming. So they're just ignoring it, like they're putting their head in the sand. And so it's a massive opportunity for the folks that, that really understand the value. The, there's crazy stats out there. The, the the, the number of people that are playing video games is, is insane all the way down to people playing like candy crush on their phone. Right. Right. But it's, it's cross genders it's crossed age. You know, I'm a 40 something year old guy. I still play video games. I went through a phase where I didn't when my kids were younger, yeah. but then, then they got older and started playing. I started playing with them. Right. So it, there's, there's a, it, it's not just kids playing video games. It's, yeah. it's all the way up. So it's, it's a massive opportunity for pe- folks that want to get on, in on it. I hope yeah. no other destinations do get on it. In on it <laughs> well, you know, as, as I'm thinking about it, I'm like, I don't, I don't know that we want to be giving away these secrets. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> We're calling so the like, panel to the beach CVV immediately. Yeah. yeah. But, but no, but it, we, yeah, want, right. we want to build the sport up, right? We want yeah, it to yeah, come yeah. big. So I think other yeah. destinations are going to have to get on it. But Mono Beach yeah. is going to be a leader, a pioneer in this area, for sure. Yeah, and it's I, I think I mean, it, it's it's not a, it, we can't look at it as a secret because if we want the industry to grow, there have to be yeah. other places that do right. it too. Otherwise, it's, it won't get, get grow to scale. So, yeah. and I think that's that's one thing our destination has been very good at over the years is seeing those these types of emerging trends and really jumping on it and we yeah. can be the first ones but we want others to also you know benefit from it because we know that that comes back around to us too because guests don't always travel to the same destinations so hard Wish to believe cool. but it's true yeah. <laughs> unfortunately they should yeah. just go back between Myrtle Beach and Panama City Beach. exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, like start just a just commuter rail <laughs> like, you know the other thing about esports though is there's a flip side to this is because video games are, are 
so mainstream stream now and it's not just playing games but it's consuming watching people play games things yeah. like Twitch, you know crazy and just, um yeah. like you know and amazon owns twitch they, they spent millions of dollars on it like five years ago because they saw this thing coming but there's an advertising opportunity and and because it's you know what often happens when there's a new market of advertising opportunity there's this thing that gary vaynerchuk calls arbitrage that happens where it tends to be cheaper you know when google ads came out it was cheaper than it is yeah. now with facebook yeah. ads it was cheaper video game ads are really really cheap right now right. and you can get in-game exposure in um like event exposure for pennies on the dollar compared to tr traditional sports and so i think marketers should be looking at um really experimenting a little bit with their budget I, i'm always a believer in having you know the core of your budget is is on the core things that you know work like 90, 80 90 percent of your budget should always be on the things you know worked and yeah. continue to optimize but 10 to 20 percent of your budget should be this explore so it's what um, tim peter calls core and explore mm -hmm. focus on the core but explore and i think esports is somewhere people should be dabbling a little bit we're getting ready to sponsor an e nas college tournament because it signals to that industry that hey we're, we're invested in you guys and it's so inexpensive relative to if we wanted to go to nascar or any other sport so it's yeah. it's it's something to look at for sure yeah yeah very interesting mm -hmm. um a little bit of a, a shift in the topic um just because i want to make sure we get to ask you this because we've talked to amy Highnote uh, a bit about it and also uh, jennifer barbie on her episode both for speaking in the destination marketing realm um, mm -hmm. for this question. But one thing that we're seeing a lot in vacation rentals right now is that acquisitions are having a major effect on destinations and, you know, for DMOs that rely on membership and, you know, different advertising programs from these vacation rental companies. If a Vacasa comes in, for example, or another you know, big box chain buys out a local company and they now do not support them being part of DMOs. It's it's setting the table for a bad situation for a lot of these organizations. And oh. you know, how what is your perspective on that? And how can how can chamber CVBs prevent themselves from a disaster <laughs> down the line? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's no doubt there's a train wreck coming, right? And and so how are you preparing <laughs> for it? Um, there's a lot of consolidation. It's not just in the vacation rental space. It's also yeah. in the hotel space, right? Yeah, in, yeah. in general. Um, accommodations especially you know post pandemic where a lot of destinations especially beach destinations fared way better than in a city destinations right. a lot of the people that have a, a lot of properties are looking to consolidate and diversify into our types of destinations so um i, I that's not going to slow down anytime soon we, we see investors looking around Myrtle beach all the time so i think it comes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning where DMOs have constructed these, these complicated funding mechanisms that's driven by tax revenue, but also by membership revenue and contribution from the accommodations. And, and I think the, the smart DMOs out there have to keep one eye on the on the present and look at what they're doing today, but they have to be planning for a future where that, that money isn't there. So right. what what we're doing is, and, and Alex, you, you've seen some of this, that it's, it's going to be a painful and it's going to take a couple of years to kind of do deconstruct and reconstruct our funding mechanisms but we're going out in, in forming brand partnerships we're, we're forming partnerships with big national brands to help generate revenue in co-op opportunities and other um just just cooperative events that um takes our alliance away from the members so so you know the members aren't gonna have to be spending nearly as much money with the dmo to keep us operational they'll still be involved from because we need to promote the destination but if we can bring in folks like coca-cola and jeep and, and work together collaboratively with them and that be a mechanism to generate unrestricted revenue that's the kind of thing we're doing now we started this year and um, we'll probably double our revenue on that initiative next year and then it'll continue to grow so i think within three years we'll be completely um off of the drug of having to go back yeah. to our members and ask for more money it's yeah. but but i think i think we have two or three years before we have to have that in place so i think we're on on, on the right timeline but but dmos that aren't preparing for this right now they're going to be in a world of hurt and what you're going to see as a destination if you're in a non-progressive dmo destination is these organizations are just going to have to shrink they're not going to be able to have the staff 
or, or the ability to operate in the way they have previously. So that's a problem, right? Because it, it, it doesn't matter how much tax revenue you're generating to promote. If you don't have skilled people deciding how that money's spent, or if that money is spent just to feed the machine to generate the unrestricted money, then then you're not doing your job, which is driving incremental new business in, in an ineffective way. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's been incredible to watch the progression of that over the years as as a board member being directly involved in it. I mean, starting, was it, I think, probably 2012, 13 or so, that's when we had a, a very robust pay-per-click model within our CBB that that was the funding source for all of our efforts there. And it produced great. I mean, we could directly see a ton of revenue being booked from the traffic that was being sent from the CBB site to us as individual members, but that mm -hmm. wasn't, it wasn't sustainable. I mean, the cost per yeah. clicks were just were out, outrageous. So we had to really re rework that model and we've reworked it a couple different times. And this is kind of like the third generation since I've been involved in it, um, seeing where this is going with the brand partnerships, but it's, you know, it's just, we've got to iterate and continue to be flexible and be collaborative. I think if that's one piece of advice that, you know, we can see and what we've seen here in Myrtle Beach is that you've just, you've really got to be creative, fl flexible, collaborative to be able to keep these models yeah. going. Because I also don't think that, you know, the regular uh, average business has any idea how much of an impact the chamber CVB makes in a destination. It's unbelievable. And I know, Stuart, yeah. when you first started in your role eight months ago, I mean, you, you had been a board member prior to that. So, and you were chair of the marketing committee. So you knew a lot about what our organization does but i remember one of the first things you said after like, <laughs> yeah. a month on the job you're like i had no idea how much we really do and how much the staff does it's just incredible and, and kudos to the staff that you work with it's just an unbelievable team but there's yeah. a lot of stuff y'all do and that's not right. just it's a village for sure campus. it really does it it's it, it it is a lot and and i think you know we we historically have probably not done the best job of telling that story of and and showing the value we drive because to your point we've been fixated on how do we how do we feed the beast of, of the revenue model right so how do we drive clicks to the members like to me if your dmo is one that is so focused on how do i get direct business to the accommodations they're doing their job wrong because because yeah. it changes where you're focused right yeah. we, we all we're all marked so we understand what a funnel is and and, and we know that if you can debate what the phases of the funnel are, it doesn't matter, but you know it goes from a, a broad base of people that are less, uh, have lo a lower affinity with your brand to a small group who have a high affinity and a likely and a high propensity to book, right? So if a DMO is only focused on generating clicks and revenue to the accommodations, it operates in that bottom of section of the funnel and it's always trying to harvest intent that already exists. The DMO's job, though, is to generate interest. So a DMO should be spending the majority of its money on top of funnel initiatives to generate that interest, to help create the gravity that attracts people, right? And so I think many DMOs, ourselves included, have, have probably been too focused historically on the bottom of funnel and not focused enough on the top of funnel. And, and then there's the really education process, I think, too, for members yeah. that, you know, they're used to back in the day that they could directly see what that revenue is from site to partner. But it's really important to I mean, I know we're in such a digital age and data is so important, but there right. are some things that you can't track. And your brand is essentially always going to be one of those. And I think right. what the DMO's role is to grow is to grow the brand of the destination. And that, yeah, that isn't grow always the brand in the health of, doing this, of the mm -hmm. destination. Right. So we should be measured on how many total, total people are coming, how much they're spending while they're here, and ultimately how much tax revenue we're generating for the municipalities. Now, you, you individually should be focused on how do you harvest that intent that the DMO is creating? How do you take your more than your fair share of that pie? And you can work with the DMO on that because a lot of DMOs have initiatives to help you get extra exposure. And it might cost a little bit more money, but but it, it's absolutely worth it because you can stretch your dollars by doing co-op programs and, and things like that with the DMO to, to focus more on that bottom of funnel stuff. But it's you're right, Alex, it's it's and that's going to be our, our job over the next couple of years is, is making sure everyone understands you. You may individually see less direct correlation between the business I send you, but your business as a whole is going to be healthier because of it, because we have a bigger pie to slice up between the members. That that's 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 where I think most DMOs have gotten wonky because they're addicted to this drug of, of last click analytics and seeing 
who who gets the credit for that booking and and that's it's it's a it's farcical because it, it just takes your eye off what's important you know yeah. which is driving incremental value business to the destination yeah. and at the end of the day it's it's really I, I always look at it it's it's about growing the calendar too because if you're in a beach yeah. destination everybody knows the summer's going to get it Again, as long as yeah, you're not yeah, in Florida and have a hurricane or an oil spill, but yeah. you know you, you have to you have to do that. But it takes the collaborative uh, network of people who are mission ready and focused, you know, and, and right. all working the, together. Um, I think it would be really great to have you back, Stuart, uh, just to talk about all of these things. And I think just maybe offer up tips for specific to yeah. vacation rentals, like some of your secret sauce that that vacation rental managers can can utilize in their business. Um, but we're clearly sure. running out of time talking about all of these great topics i wanted to ask you a couple of questions um one of them just a frivolous star wars question because you're a star and wars for any, anybody that's not uh, or that's just listening if you're watching <laughs> you'll notice behind annie is a star wars helmet and annie's also a major star wars fan apparently <laughs> well my husband is our dog okay. is, yeah so it's it's more my husband i'm just by marriage but um so i and I, your I, dog's I, name and Kylo, my dog i didn't even know that was a star Kylo, wars yeah. thing until um so I just, there are so many questions and I have a feeling, you know, the answer to every single one of them, but this was one that I just didn't actually know the answer to was how many languages does C3PO speak? Oh man, isn't it over, um, oh man, 13 million forms of communication, something like that. 60 was it million. Six, six million. 60 million, okay. Wow. That's just insane. So we yeah. have a whole lot of languages to learn here. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> but um, but but for a for a more poignant question to our audience that they'll be more interested in, um, what is one of your greatest accomplishments that you've done through your career? I think you probably have a million of them, but what is something that stands out to you that you're most proud of? Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm a I'm a cathedral thinker. I like to build big things that that grow on beyond me, and and I, I like to think that the biggest legacy things haven't been created yet. That we're we're especially here at the DMO, we're building some things that are going to last, but. I've got to point back to the podcast that we did at Fuel is probably the thing I'm most proud of because we, we literally started out with a $80 Yeti microphone in an idea that we wanted to change the, the hotel industry and we wanted to educate people on the things that were frustrating us about, you know, the mistakes people were making and we were having these really interesting deep conversations at lunchtime. Um, just a bunch of friends sitting around that happened to work work together and so we said let's let's put this out as a podcast and this is really before podcasting became main mainstream it was right around the time that serial took off and people started jumping on the bandwagon and so we're like let's do this we don't know how to do it let's and i've always been someone that's just let's figure it out let's just be scrappy and you know you can learn anything on the internet so we went and figured out how to record edit publish a podcast and you know the first few were a little rough but they were fun and we we knew when we started, we wanted it to be authentic to ourselves. We wanted it to be something people would enjoy listening to. And so if you go back and listen to some of the episodes, they're, they're really ridiculous at times, but. Um, <laughs> but hilarious. <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, I felt so, you know, and I feel, felt like if we could make ourselves laugh, we would make other people laugh. So, right. you know, but but we never lost sight of, of a couple of things. One, we wanted to be authentic to ourselves, but two, we wanted to be valuable in a way that was tangible and actionable. So every episode was constructed around some thought, you know, or some some specific tactic. We did get strategic at times, but a lot of it was like more tangible than that. So we, we started, you know, with a couple of, you know, dozen listeners and then it got to a couple of hundred and then a couple of thousand and it just kept growing and growing until, you know, four or five years later, we were the number one hotel podcast out there. Like if you search for hotel marketing podcast, it, what was the fuel hotel marketing podcast is now the, the travel boom hotel marketing podcast. Um, it was, it was immense to see. And, and it, you know, you guys are already reaping these rewards because what, what happened was it put us on the map in a way that we, we didn't expect that people started, you know, seeing us as an authority, we started getting invited to speak at conferences. We got a lot of business. I mean, by the time I left Fuel, 95% of our leads that came in would reference the podcast. And the yeah. great thing was, as soon as you started having a conversation, you realized they already knew and trusted you. They were ready right. to do business yeah. because yeah. They, they'd been listening to you for the last three or four years. So no one was a stranger. And it was it was, it was was really cool. It was something that just built to, to be become bigger than any one of us individually. And Pete, Pete and team are doing a great job continuing that legacy now. So $80 and, and we built an empire, you know, yeah. it was a lot of fun along the way. 
that's, that's uh, awesome. And we've listened to it. I know Alex was a huge fan and it was kind of one of the things that gave us the, the gumption to get out there and do what we're doing is what you guys did. And so I, I applaud you for what you set up for the rest of us. Well, thank you. I, I definitely, I, 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 it would be remiss not to recognize like the, what our team did has inspired a lot. Like that's probably the thing that gets me. Well, there's two things that really get me. One is folks like yourselves that, that you know, Alex had been a guest on our show and others have too, but people that would come to us and say, you know, you inspired us to create something. And, and, and that means a lot, but then the, the folks that would listen and you, you guys will get this as your, your show matures and your audience becomes a family. People would come to us that listen and we impacted their business in a meaningful way. At the beginning of the pandemic, we saw um, a lot of people really struggling and not know what to do. So we said, let's use our platform to help people that are trying to figure it out. So we went from weekly to daily for like a three or four week period, right, right in March time. And we literally were getting emails saying, you saved our business. We thought yeah. we were going to have to <laughs> shut our doors. And what you told yeah. us say, literally saved our business. And it's like, yeah. it just gives me chills thinking about that stuff. Yeah. So that's great. Just that's keep helping great. man. Just keep helping yeah. people do, yeah, do awesome. the things that no one else is willing to work hard to do. I remember the episodes that you had about um, how to deal with d disasters and hurricanes and the whole protocol of steps. I mean, that information was so timely and helpful to everybody in, at that time because, you know, Myrtle Beach for a while there, we had a hurricane or a water event every fall, it seemed like. But before that, we hadn't had anything in years. And it was like, we were all just scrambling to figure out what the communication needs to be. And you guys really put your heads together as you know business strategists, but also knowing how the means we have to communicate and came up with this great plan that we definitely took those, that, that advice and used within our business. And I know a lot of other ones did too, but it was quite remarkable. <laughs> yeah, it's very humbling when you, when you realize how, how vast the scope is of the impact you had, you know, yeah. So yeah. you guys are just starting this journey, you know, five, six years from now, it's going to be immense. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Save the world one day at a time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Stuart, thank you so much for being here with us today. This means a lot and we truly appreciate the time and your knowledge and vast knowledge of hospitality and, and destination marketing. And, you know, that's, this is one of the pillars of topics that Annie and I, set out to really explore and is destination marketing because we've both been actively involved in our local areas and, and see the impact of it. So it's mm -hmm. great to have these conversations and we're going to continue to, to focus on this topic and, you know, just bring, connect the dots between how vacation rental companies and hospitality in general can really leverage um, the power of those organizations because there's a lot of power there that can be used for great good within a destination. So <laughs> very exciting. Um, but if anybody wants to get in touch with you, Stuart, how would they, how should they do that? Yeah, you can, you can find me anywhere on social medias as, as just Stuart Butler, it's S-T-U-A-R-T. Um, or you can, you can shoot me an email if you're interested, stuart.butler at visitmonobeach.com. Awesome. And yeah, LinkedIn, same thing. We'll put mm -hmm. um, uh, your contact info in the show notes. If anybody wants to contact Annie and I, you can go to alexandanniepodcast.com and be sure to subscribe if you aren't already subscribed. And if you are listening and you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a review. We would love to hear your thoughts and feedback or any topics that you'd like to hear about on an upcoming show. Uh, but until the next time, thank you everybody for tuning in. We will talk to you soon. Bye.